If you had to pick one HF antenna to use as a ham radio prepper, which one would you choose? For me, I'm looking for the one that is best value for the dollar, most versatile as far as configurations and settings you can set it up. I can get short distance as well as long distance DXing in. It's lightweight. I can use it as a base unit. I can use it as a mobile unit. What antenna is that? It's the NFED Halfwave HF antenna. And in today's video, I'll break down the information about the antenna, including areas like why you may want a resident versus a non-resident antenna. What are the different manufacturers offering? What are the different setups that you can get from it? And I'll go in a little bit of a deeper dive into a near vertical incident sky wave setup so that you can use the 40 and 80 meters to reach within 300 miles of your location. If this sounds of interest to you, let's get started. Hey, this is MJ, call sign KW3KW, and welcome to another episode of Ham Radio Made Simple. Today is my second part series, and it's basically Ham Radio for Prepping, and this is episode number three within this series. I'm going to be focusing on NFED half-wave HF antennas. I really appreciate all of you who have hit the like button, the subscribe button, and the great comments that we're getting. A lot more people are having access to these videos. Again, I'm not making money off of this, nor do I ever see myself doing that. But I am reaching more people that are probably like yourself, uh, non-technical, trying to get into ham radio, and want someone to make it simple and give you all the information and not have these information gaps. So please hit the like, subscribe, and continue the comments, and, and call me out where I'm wrong, and call me out where I'm right. So thank you so much. Today's agenda, I'm going to be going over exactly what is an NFED half-wave antenna, and make sure that you understand that there's a difference between one that is resident versus non-resident. They operate differently. I'm going to get into NVIS, which is Near Vertical Incident Sky Wave Antenna. And this is a setup with, the, with this um, NFED half wave that you can actually do 40 meter, 80 meter within 300 miles. And so instead of having the skip zone go way over these, you can actually use it for emergency services to get more local communication going, which to me was one of the reasons I got into this. So who are the manufacturers out there that make them? They're all not the same. So don't assume that you buy one NFED halfway from another manufacturer to the other. They're exactly the same. They have different requirements and they have pros and cons for each. So I'm going to go over what to look for, go through a couple of manual sightings just to point out to show you what you need to be aware of before you buy something and then get stuck into something you realize that wasn't really what you were looking for. And then I'll wrap this up into a neat bow, into a summary so you can walk away and say, you know what? I really have my hands around what an NFED half-wave antenna is, how to deploy it, how I could possibly use it, and have fun with it. So we're going to start with the assumption is I'm only talking about manufactured NFED half-wave antennas. There are plenty other videos out there showing you how to make your own. That's not what the purpose of this video is. I wanted to go to someone who had years of engineering experience, have perfected these antennas, have made it work perfect, and did not want to have to go through the, the long learning curve of how to make it work. I wanted to basically deploy it, set it, and forget it, basically. But there's still a learning curve, but it's not in you having to make it. Typically, uh, most of us are out there with 100 watt uh, power that we're going to be doing it, which is ideal to focus on. But be aware, these things go 250 watts, 500 watts, up to 1500 watts single sideband. Again, check the manual, make sure you know what you're getting based on the power output that you're expecting. If I had to design the perfect antenna, the first thing I would want is to make sure it provides multiband operation. If I could go from 6 to 160, that's the ideal one. And again, compromises are going to have to come along the way. But there is one manufacturer that does offer that. I'd want something that's very stealth, whether I'm putting it in my, in my house as my base unit and with my HOA would hardly see it at all. At the same time, it's mobile, goes into a backpack, light and versatile. Versatile configurations. What I mean by that, I can do an Envis configuration. I can do an inverted L. I can do a sloper. I can do uh, different heights. You want something that is just not a single like vertical antenna that sits up and you're limited to, to what, what it's doing. This is a great antenna. I would also want something that's called a workable SWR. You may not get 1 to 1 or 1 1.5 to 1, but if you got 2 to 1 on a couple of the bands, then it's workable. You could still use it. You're just going to have a little bit less power. I want something small. I want something lightweight. And I want something portable. And I want something to be able to you know, throw, throw in my go bag or just have it up around the house, uh, outside my house, and set it up quickly. So 
This is what the goal is. Now, let me go through this presentation and see how much we can line up to this based on the manufacturer's offerings of each of the NFED half-wave antennas. So a typical setup is what you're going to see here is a matching transformer. You can see your coax line. You're going to see a tree, a pole building, uh, something that you can hook your line to, and your line is going to run. Um, typically, the lines can vary anywhere from like 63 feet uh, up to what I think is about 133 feet in length of wire. And I'll get more into that in just a little bit. So length does matter. When we look at a typical dipole, in the center here, we have our center conductor. You have quarter wave, quarter wave, which makes this a total half wave. So uh, it's designed in the center, wires run each way. Remember on the end fed, it basically goes on the end, it goes out one direction. And it doesn't have to necessarily go in a straight line. I have two wires out, one curves, you know, like almost like a uh, big U around trees in my backyard and one that goes straight out. And there's, they operate a little bit different in what I can get out of it, but believe it or not, they're pretty close in how they operate. So this is what you typically see when you're looking at a dipole. And uh, so if I wanted to do, for example, 180 meter, um, uh, I'd need a 260 feet length of a dipole here. Or if I want 80 meters, I need 133 feet. That's a lot of wire. A lot of us don't have the space to do that in. But with the NFED half wave, which you see right here, here's the matching transformer. You have your wire. It all goes out of one end. And inside this box is known as a, a wound toroid. And depending on, that's a new, uh, based on the number of wraps that you put around it, uh, determines uh, what you can do with this particular antenna. So I'll get in more into that in just a bit. But look at this. I can take the NFED half wave, my Chameleon MCOM2, I can get 6 meters to 160 meters with 63 to feet of wire versus a dipole that's going to require 260 feet. Are there trade-offs? Yes, there are trade-offs. But like anything, you have to decide what's most important to you when, you, when you're uh, putting up an antenna and what you want to use it for. So let's talk about a resonant NFED half wave. Well, the thing that you have to be aware of, if you're, you're going to hear the term baseband. And so it's either cut for an 80 meter or a 40 meter. So if it's 80 meter, you can get a resonant NFED half wave antenna, 133 feet long. It's going to give you the 80, the 40, the 20, the 15, and the 10 meters on it. Now, if you hear the baseband of 40, you don't get the 80. So essentially it's 67 feet and you're getting 40, 20, 15, and 10. What you're going to see the difference is if you had an SWR meter, you're going to get a sharp peak. So here's a resident, it, and it doesn't necessarily fall in the center of the frequency. Uh, just to point this out right now, if I'm doing multiple frequencies in here, I may hit center in one, I may hit off here in another, on this side of another uh, frequency. So it doesn't line up center, but the, the shape of the SWR is going to be very sharp to the peak, which means you're going to have a great sweet spot at some point in the frequency, and you're going to lose as you go to either side of the band. So just be aware of that versus a non-resident has a more of a gradual sloper that comes down like this, and it may not go down as deep. I have a lower SWR, but it is, uh, it's going to give you uh, more SWR, uh, better performance over a wider range within that frequency. So uh, things are going to impact your SWR, remember, too. The height of the wire is going to determine it. Uh, nearby objects are going to impact it. So uh, topography is going to impact it. Uh, ground soil, whether it's you're near water, all of this has impact on your SWR. Generally speaking, this is what I'm talking about. Um, the highest voltage is going to be at the feed point end. So if you remember when I showed you where you connect your coax cable into the matching transformer, that is going to be the hottest part of the wire on a resident antenna. And uh, make sure no one has access or can touch that because it can be burning to people's hands if they do touch it. Uh, and the nice thing about a resident antenna is most often you don't need a tuner. So I can go with a NFED half wave if I just wanted 40 meters, 67 feet of length, um, pretty easy to uh, put up. And most often you don't even need a tuner because it's resident within these bands. But again, there are trade-offs. If we look at a non-resident, and here's an example of the, the polymer one, uh, a chameleon on it. Again, you have your coax feed, goes into your matching transformer, and you got your half wavelength wire. And again, does not have to be straight. What you're going to want to look at is the wide range SWR that I pointed out. That's an upside on it. A uh, shorter wire, you can get multiband, uh, 80 meters. Typically, you're going to get 10 to 80 meters is what you're looking at for most of these uh, vendors that are out there, except chameleon. They'll go 6 to 160. But again, a trade-off. Uh, setup is fast and easy. Um, uh, cause it's a shorter wire, 
broadband matching impedance transformer uh, is the key part of the whole function of this antenna. So just make sure you get a good quality one. You're going to see different numbers thrown around. They're going to say 49 to 1, 9 to 1, 5 to 1, 4 to 1. These are unums, which is unbalanced to unbalanced. And so, uh, again, depending on the manufacturer, Chameleon is 5 to 1. I've seen Palomar's, I think, up to 49 to 1 and 9 to 1. Uh, Nelson Antennas, uh, MFJ, they're all different ones. So, um, But the bottom line, what you want to find is look in the manual and look at two things. You want to find what the SWR uh, pattern is over the multiple bands. And a lot of times they'll show that to you. As, uh, as well as what the radiation pattern is, depending on your setup. Now, a downside on this is a feed line choke is going to be typically required by the manufacturers, and this is to keep the RF, the common noise, out of your shack. Now, they'll say if your coax exceeds uh, you know, 50 feet of coax at you know, a higher quality of coax, you may not need uh, the feed line choke. So again, uh, depending on the manufacturers, some say you absolutely need it. Some say, depending on the length of your uh, coax cable, may, you may not need it. So just be aware. Tuner, some bands you might need it. Other bands you will not need it. Typically for mine with my Chameleon, I find that the uh, the 10, the 15, the 17, um, the 20 does not require a tuner. But when I got up to the 80 and the 40, it was around like, you know, 2.1 to 2.5 to 1, uh, which I do have a tuner built into mine, but you can still get away. It's It's still considered workable. Now, let's just talk quickly, and I'll get into more detail about this later, but what are the different type of configurations for NFET half-wave antennas? You've got your sloping wire, and what I want to point out here is this is up 25 to 40 feet high, your end, your matching transformer is typically low. Some of the manufacturers say, you know, you have to have it 3 to 40 feet off the ground, and this is the setup that they prefer to get the optimal uh, uh, bands and SWR out of that particular um, NFET half-wave. So just be aware. Sloping wire is probably the most common you're going to see. You could have the inverted L, and what you're going to get is, you know, 25 feet up, and let's say if the wire is 65 feet, then you got 45 feet of wire going this way. And again, it does not have to be necessarily straight. It can zigzag around. It will impact your performance, but something is better than nothing. Never forget that. Uh, configuration, uh, another one could be Envis, and this is the one I like. This is for shorter distance versus DXing, which is long distance. And this is particularly only for the 40 and 80 meters. Don't think of Envis as working on the 20 meter, you know, on the 10 meter, 17 meter. It's only on the 40 and 80 meter. So typically how this works is you're going to go anywhere, and some, some manuals are showing 9 feet to 12 feet up. So this one you're actually going to hang up higher than the 3 to 4 feet off the ground that some of the other manufacturers suggest. And this is uh, the Chameleon MCOM 2. And then you run your wire out. And again, it does not have to be straight. Uh, and you're going to find that you're going to be able to pick up your 40 and 80 meters a lot closer uh, within 300 miles of you. So excellent, excellent way for preppers to have a, a way of being able to pick up the 40, 80 meters, which are good bands, closer to you without the skip zones. You can also take the same antenna if you want. Forget it. To make, you know, don't make it an envis. You can go 15 feet up to 35 feet. The higher up you go, the greater the... the um, the launch angle is going to become, which I'll get into in just a second, and that's going to allow you then to go longer distance. So if you're saying, hey, I want the antenna, forget the Envis, I don't need it, just take it up higher, and it's a great antenna for long distance. And by the way, I have my Envis set up at 10 to 12 feet on the 20 meters and 17 meters. I'm picking up Europe and I'm from North Carolina and uh, South America on 20, 40 meters at 10 to 12 feet high. So uh, it doesn't impact 20 and 40 meters on the height as much as I can tell right now. So non-residents may require a counterpose. And the reason I bring this up is, and the manuals, and, I, and from personal experience, to get my SWR reading down, I had to use like a 50-foot counterpose. The manuals will tell you to do, you know, go underneath the wire or out this way from the wire. I just had my uh, Rig Expert 600, uh, you know, um, antenna meter <clears throat> on, and I was looking at my SWR. And I found that I actually went off in like a 45 degree angle. And actually, that's where I got my best uh, SWR reading. So they give you what they think might be the best solution, but you're going to have to just set it up, try it, practice it, and figure out what works best. It's not always as they say. Now, what are the downsides to the NFED on this? Well, you, it takes work to correctly lower your SWR on the 40 and 80 meters. I found that. 20, 15, 10, I mean, they work great. But it takes work, but it's worth the effort to do it. Um, a counterpose, I'd start with that. 
uh, go you know, again horizontal to the wire, then move it out. And believe it or not, I actually went up and down my pole a couple times and then went out and got the best readings. Don't tell me why. So maybe someone can comment in. But I actually went up and down, uh, you know, 10 foot, uh, uh, 12 foot pole where my antenna hangs on before I took it out and it worked the best there. Go figure. Um, grounding, well, if this is your base antenna, you're obviously going to want to protect it and protect your equipment. So you're going to want to put a ground on it. But from my personal experience, just trying it, I used the counter post versus the grounding. And uh, the grounding didn't give me anything better than the counter post. Actually, I got better SWR readings by just doing the uh, 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 the, the counter post wire that went out there. But I still grounded the antenna because I have multiple antennas all together. Tuner required, it, uh, to be honest with you, most likely if you want the best uh, optimization of that band, you know, tuner is required. Now I'll talk a little about a low-end uh, antenna tuner that you can use. So just be aware that this is a typical type of graph they may show in the manual. And this is what they're going to show you with the SWR readings with our, within the bands. And this is what you want to look for and to say, oh my gosh, you know, at, uh, you know, six meters, okay, I'm under two, uh, 10 meters, uh, I may be up, you know, like uh, 2.5. This is what they that they got from their from their reading. So this is a great way to kind of get a a first glance at what the SWR possibilities are based on their own studies. So let's talk more about near vertical incident sky wave antenna, and it's all about the launch angle, how it works. So if I take my antenna nine to twelve feet off the ground, and my wire runs parallel to the ground, you know, if I'm on a slope, I just keep it parallel to the ground, and I'm trying. To, my goal is to get you know anywhere from like 30 to uh, 400 mile range that's in there or zero to 300, depending on, again, who's manufacturer that you talk to. But this is what you're trying to do. Typically, you know, you're 40 to 80 meters unless you have a, you know, 1500 watts of power, you're on a 40 foot tower, you got a hex beam antenna and, and you're, you're basically able to get anybody anywhere at any time. But for us guys, like, you know, 85 watts, 100 watts, trying to run this stuff in a, in a difficult uh, uh, terrain, um, to try to get that, an NBIS is going to be required. Now, it doesn't have to be straight, and I keep telling you this, so this is nice, so you can zigzag around. One of my friends who has it, he actually put it under the eaves of his house, and it goes around the sides of his house. And uh, again, he can pick up Europe, and he can pick up South America. So the um, nice thing about this is it's very versatile. So if we look at it, the higher up you take your wire, your launch angle changes. So if we can look over here, look at the degree, if a wire goes up, the signal goes down, it's going to change the launch angle. So you have a longer skip zone when the wire goes higher. But if we have a lower wire, we're going to lower the launch angle. It's going to be smaller, and that's why you're going to get a smaller skip zone. And that's the beauty of taking the wire down lower and for an NVIS configuration. Does that make sense? So why NVIS? Well, it was actually uh, used by emergency service, and if, if I'm correct, and someone else can correct me on this, uh, back in Vietnam, they found in the jungle that uh, they couldn't get more local area and the 40 and 80 meters, and that's when they started dropping the wire down. And so they were able to find out that they could get um, near distance, like going over a hill that was right next to them and being able to reach the other uh, troops over around them. So in the jungle with hills, this actually was perfect because it wasn't skipping over. It just went over the top of the mount or top of the hills, whatever it was, and got into the next area. But when you look at it, it's uh, ham radio communication for zero, 300 miles. Um, typically, remember, 40, 80 meters only. We do, you're you're going to reduce the launch angle to be able to pick that up, and the skip zone is shorter. So closer contact. So what's the expected range on some of this stuff? 40 to 80 meters, think of it as regional. Uh, on the 10 to 20 meters, think of it as uh, you can actually do long distance. So 40, 80 meters, you're going to get the local. 10 to 20 meters, you're going to get... To me, I call it DXing, and like I mentioned earlier, I've picked up multiple countries all over the place, and even using Whisper, which is a way to be able to do a digital signal at low watt power, I actually went to uh, South Africa uh, on my NBIS, which is pretty impressive. So if we look at uh, on the 160 meter band, um, it's, it's going to be long distance on the 160 meter band, not necessarily, again, local or regional. Now, each setup is going to vary by, again, by manufacturer, but let me just pull up from the manual for the Chameleon MCOM2 uh, N-Fed half-wave antenna. This is in their manual. Link is in the description below. You can stop and pause and read this, but bottom line is what they're saying is 
When they consider the distance, ground is considered 0 to 90 miles in range, short is 0 to 300, medium is 300 to 1,500 miles, and long is, uh, is 1,500 miles. So if I'm doing an NVIS antenna right in here, they're telling me what I can get as far as my, I'm going to get short distance and, and medium. Sloping wire, and again, these arrows mean something which is broken all out, but sloping wire is going to be different versus an inverted L. So you can see that all of them are going to be different, and even the directionality is going to vary based on your setup. So let's kind of break this down a little bit more in here. Again, 40 and 80 meters in an NVIS setting is going to be different than 160 and your 2015 and 10 meters. So again, remember, NVIS is unique. So when we look at a sloping wire, remember, we're talking about 25 to uh, 40 feet high, um, your matching transformer is going to be down, you know, three to four feet or lower off the ground. Again, whatever the manufacturer recommends, your coax cable, what you're going to get on performance on this, you can expect your ground for the 40 to 80 meters, you can, you can get zero to 90 miles. So this is a great way for, again, emergency communication near you, set up a sloping wire like this, and you can get zero to 90 miles. And... Uh, the medium range for everything but the 40 and 80, you can expect 300 to 1,500 uh, miles of range off of this, and it's omnidirectional. Uh, another setup is considered inverted L. Again, 25 feet up, maybe 45 feet over, low to the ground. What you're going to get on this is, again, 0 to 90 miles on the 40 to 80 meters, and medium you're going to get 300 to 1,500 miles on the 10 to 160 less the 40 and 80 meters that are out there. And this one is unit directional. So again, you're going to have to check the radiation patterns based on is it radiating off, where are the lobes coming off of the wire, what directions are they going on that. So again, you can start to see these different setups, whether it be an inverted L, uh, whether it be an NVIS, whatever it is, they all have their advantages and purposes to what they're trying to do. So if we look at the NVIS here, again, 10 to 12 feet, actually 9 to 12 feet, and your wire's going to run out, doesn't have to be necessarily uh, straight. Um, you're going to get 0 to 300 miles, which I found is pretty accurate on the 40 and 80 meters. And I get about 300 to 1,500 miles on all the other bands. And it is omnidirectional to a degree uh, based on the hill against the side of my house and et cetera. So topography is going to play a role into it too. Other setup uh, similar to the Envis is you can basically just take the NFED antenna, which I know a lot of people do, and they just run the wire out, curve it around. They, they bring it up, you know, 25, 30 feet. Again, the higher, the greater the launch angle, the greater the DXing or the long distance that you're going to do. So great base station antenna, just take it up higher. That's all you have to do, and it's going to change the launch angle. Now, uh, the Chameleon has multiple variations that are out there. Typically, it's about $130 uh, for, again, inflation's hitting the time we live in, guys. Who knows what it could be? It could be $200 uh, next week. Anyhow, it's t t as of today, it was like $130, depending if you shopped around. But they came out with a newer version. So this is the older version, the cylinder, uh, and this happens to be the box. It happens to the wound tour right happens to be in. I prefer this because it seems a little bit more watertight, but, uh, and again, you know, it is... Um, uh, protected by the manufacturer, and they state and claim behind, uh, that it is sealed properly on it. Remember, this is a non-resident antenna. This antenna was my choice because I can get 60 to 160 for, um, and again, peak power can go anywhere from 250 watts on CW, 500 on single sideband. Length is about 63 feet. It's a great uh, grade copper wire. I actually got the one that's the black band because uh, they had it at the time. And just, you know, if you're doing stealth, the green, maybe in an open green field, it works good. But if you're in the woods or in the backyard, I find that the black is less noticeable, less sun reflection off of it. So just uh, my two cents on it. Tutor may be required in the 40 and 80 meter. Counterpose is required from my experience in doing it. Two pounds. Can you beat that? Throw that in your backpack. Uh, I do use an RF choke. Um, and, and again, I'll get into what those look like. But the bottom line is ferrite beads. Uh, you can get a those and just wrap them at the uh, end of your coax before they go into your transceiver. You know, it maybe cost you 15, 20 bucks and you'll eliminate that or if your coax is long enough. MyAntennas.com is another choice out there, $199. They, this is a resident antenna versus a non-resident on the Chameleon. This is resident 80, 40, 30, 20, 17, 15, 12, and 10. Uh, again, pretty powerful antenna. However, its uh, base band is 80, which means it's like 130 feet um, of wire, so you're going to have to be able to put that up. Um, no tuner is needed, which is really nice on this antenna. 
Uh, it works great on these for Aries, MCOM, different emergency services that are out there. You can do 250 watts continuous and digital mode as FT8. And, that, and I'll speak about that here in just a second. Uh, it's pretty well stealth. I love the black wire, the setup. It's portable. To, it's a really nice one. Again, links will be uh, in the description uh, below. Palomar Engineers makes a, a great products, great host of offerings that are out there. Uh, one of the most popular ones is their bullet and fed 500 watt antenna. Uh, 1.8 meters to 61 megahertz, $100 at the time. But again, it's on the length of the wire is going to determine the cost too. So be aware of that. And the length of the wire also determines the quality of your SWR. So look through the manual and make sure you put that up. But you can get 500 peak uh, power out of it. Range 60, 6 meters to 160, again, predicated on the length of wire you choose, which will impact the price. Uh, so make sure that you know it has a dual, coal, a dual co co core ferret 9 to 1 unum for higher power ratings, not a single uh, wound tour. They have a dual core. So, uh, again, excellent, very, very smart people here. Uh, read the recommendations and also read the manual. You're going to want to make sure that you not only shop around for like the different manufacturers that are out there, such as here are the reputable ones that I found. And if anyone can, knows of something different or better, please put it in the comment section. But Chameleon, Palomar Engineers, MyAntennas.com, MFJ Enterprises, Nelson Antennas, or Radio Waves seem to make pretty good products. Um, shop around, but always check first. Do you want a resident or non-resident? And which offering are they presenting to you? And the transmitting power for the antenna, you have to think of it in two areas, the single sideband, um, as well as your digital and CW. So just because it's 500 at single sideband doesn't mean it's doing 500 in digital or CW. So make sure you look for those details. Um, <clears throat> you may have to buy a counterpose. Not all, I would say most of them don't include a counterpose, even though they're required in their instructions. So you can buy anywhere from an 18 to 22 gauge insulated stranded wire to be used as a counterpose and uh, put that on the ground. Counterposes you don't uh, bury on the ground, you lay it on the top. Um, you typically could see they're going to require two 15 foots or 120 foot. And in the chameleon case, it's a 50 foot wire. So 50 feet of wire should be good. And again, always remember to download the manuals and look for these type of details. Now, within the manuals, you're going to find that some of them require that, you know, that the length of your coax line be at least a quarter wavelength on the lowest operating system. So uh, another thing I found on Palomar Engineering is that they do recommend a feed line choke at the end of the coax line near the radio. And this is what one looks like. Here's a chameleon one. They sell their own. Palomar does, or you can make your own. Uh, typically, you're probably looking anywhere from like, you know, $30 to $50 in price that's out there. And when you see a, a recommended feed line choke, is it for a resident or non-resident antenna? Okay, those who said non-resident antenna are correct. Now, the matching transformer in, there, in the Palomar is going to basically tell you that they want it as close to the ground as possible, you know, within 36 inches or less. Again, they, use, they like the sloper model, and that's what they recommend. So read the manuals when you're doing it here. So... Uh, here it's going to show you how to set it up. Here they show a 15-foot counterpose, 18-foot goes up vertical, 37-foot swing wire, and this is for the sloper or inverted L. So uh, either way, the, you can use this uh, setup, but they do it different than what Chameleon offers, for example, or what MFJ is going to go in there. If you look under reviews, this is something that I just said, okay, let me just kind of sign, find some reviews and what I came up with. Here is a, an individual said, and whether it be true or not, I don't know, but again, I just look at reviews for more data points. But it said the kit was fine if you're using it for single sideband. It handled 1,000 watts on all resident bands just fine. However, when I used it for the FT8 at 200 watts, the ferrite overheated and failed. So bottom line is you can get more information from the reviews than just the manuals themselves. So just FYI on it. Now here's someone that made their own uh, feed line choke, they just took uh, ferrite beads, put it at the end of the coax cable, and then knocked out the RFI. So again, you can buy it, you can buy your own ferrite beads, your choice. Uh, again, within the manual, it's going to show you the SWR readings that you should expect. It doesn't mean you will get them. And then this is kind of like, you know, the, the EPA on your, your car. It's, you know, with no wind, flat surface, uh, right temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a good base mark to start from, but you may not get it. Now, um, 
There are other low-cost options out there. For example, you can get an NFED antenna that doesn't cover most of the bands. You may just get it for 40 meters, 20, 15, and 10. Here's like an MFJ uh, product that has theirs. It's about $85. You're not going to get the 80 meters, uh, and you're not going to get the 17 meters. It is a non-resident one. So, again, these are the things as you look around. Maybe 67 feet of wire is acceptable. It's not much different than 63 from Chameleon, for example. Uh, but if the price is important to you and you're really not interested in 80 meters, then go for it. Um, but check if it needs a tuner. I always want to know that. Uh, Radio Waves has their own $100 uh, solution. Again, more choices for you to look out there. If it does need a tuner, you can get, like from MFJ Enterprises, you can get a travel antenna tuner. It's $150. It's uh, 10 meters through 80 meters. Uh, it's, again, at the time of this recording, that's the price. Uh, could be higher by the time you listen to this with inflation running, but just know there are lo lower end options that are out there. So uh, SWR meter uh, is really going to be critical. Borrow from somebody. I don't mind lending mine out to people that need to use it because uh, I know they're you know they're going to handle it with care. But that's something that you need is be able to experiment on your location as you set up your antenna and optimize your readings as, as possible. So let's just summarize. Why are you going to use an NFED half wave antenna? for HF. Well, multiband operation, you can go from one particular brand, the Chameleon, 6 meter to 160 meters. Other are going to give you 10 meters to through 40 or 10 through 80. So it's a great multiband antenna. It's lightweight, portable for, for either base use or home use of, of versatile configurations, the sloper, the inverted L, the NVIS, multiple ways you can do it. And again, it doesn't have to be in a straight line. Very affordable. Yeah, up to you know, I've seen them probably in the higher end, about 250, typically around 130. Again, at the time of this recording, again, very fast setup. Uh, takes less space and is pretty well stealth. And again, are you looking at non-resident or resident? Determine on your needs and what you're willing to put up with. It's always a trade-off. What do you? What's most important to you? Um, there are other videos that I put out there on resident versus non-resident antenna, so you can go deeper, harmonics within resident. So again, this will all be in the description below. So in summary, there is no perfect antenna. There's always a compromise, and you have to prioritize what's most important to you. So you want a resident versus non-resident. Do you want to uh, be able to do NVIS? For, for preppers to me, that is a must. Near vertical incident sky wave, you really want that for your 40 and 80 meters. Uh, tuner, this is where you're going to have to find that in most cases you don't need it on certain bands, but a couple bands you may re be required to use a tuner. Um, match the power ratings. If you're doing QRP low power, then you don't need to buy a $250 NFED antenna that's going to give you 1,500 watts. So match the power, match the type that you're using, whether it's voice or digital, and uh, you buy the right one according to what you're looking for. As far as all of this is, if you don't set it up, practice and modify as needed, and the time that you're going to need to use this when uh, basically the uh, uh, poop hits the fan, um, you're in trouble. That's why I tell people, I know a lot of people that are in ham radio, but they're, they're not practicing, they're not using it, and <clears throat> they're not ready then. You're not going to have that time to try to figure out what works and what doesn't work. Do it now. So the next videos I, I'm going to do, and again, I apologize for not coming out sooner. I've had a couple surgeries. And it looks like I may have another major surgery coming here soon, but I'll try to get out the HF digital mode once and why HF digital is critical to a prepper and it really has advantages over voice. Uh, so uh, look for that one to come out next. Um, talk about solar options because if you have no power, then none of this equipment works at all. So you, if you don't have a solar uh, backup option, then your ham radio is not going to do you much good. And there are prepper organizations that are out there that you can connect with and I'll do a short video on that. So... This is MJ, KW3KW, with Ham Radio Made Simple, thanking you for watching this. And again, if you hit the like button, the subscribe, and hit the comments, I greatly appreciate it. And hopefully others can find this, and I hopefully you enjoyed it, and I appreciate your support. And thank you. This is MJ, out. <laughs>